Well, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, or good morning, wherever you are. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this, the seventh uh, in uh, the lecture series, uh, Development Matters, which is sponsored by Irish Aid, the Irish government's uh, development cooperation program. We're delighted to be joined today by Emanuela Del Rey, who is the EU, EU Special Representative uh, for the Sahel. Um, uh, Manuela has taken time out of her extremely busy and challenging agenda to talk to us today on the many uh, challenges, threats, but also opportunities associated with, with that region. Um, a few housekeeping points to begin with. Uh, Professor Del Rey will speak to us for about 20 minutes or so, and we will then have a Q&A. Um, uh, for those of you in the room, uh, please raise your hand if you have a question at that point, and we'll come to you with a roving mic. For those of you tuning in online, you'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function, uh, which you'll find on your screen. Um, today's uh, presentation and the Q&A uh, are both on the record, as usual. Um, and please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. And we're also live streaming the discussion, so a very warm welcome to those who are tuning in via YouTube. At this point, I'd like to ask the Director General of Irish Aid, Michael Gaffey, to say a few words by way of introduction to Emanuela. And once again, Emanuela, you're very, very welcome. And we will talk in a moment about your close Irish connections. Michael. <laughs> Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon and good morning, everybody. Um, I, of, I always introduce these lectures and just do it very briefly because uh, we're here to, to, for, for the speaker. But it's the, the Development Matters series of lectures has, is proving to be a really sort of exciting and useful uh, series where we have, uh, through an engage, a partnership between Irish Aid and the IIEA, we're managing to get really influential and good speakers to come, not just about development, but about all issues around and relating to uh, development cooperation. And uh, we really are hugely honoured. We've been trying for a long time to get this meeting, but to have with us today, Emanuela Del Rey, uh, the EU Special Representative for the uh, Sahel. We've had meetings with her today. We've had meetings in the past with her in Brussels, but I just want to say she is one of the most active EU representatives in any uh, geographic area that I've certainly um, uh, met. And she is a real uh, thinker and a doer. Uh, and uh, I think, we, well, she is the EU Special Representative since 2021. It is important to note also that she has experience in many areas, many areas of conflict, including the Balkans, including the uh, Middle East. She knows a lot about Northern Ireland. She knows a lot about Irish uh, music. Um, and uh, she, she is... Um, I don't, I don't know, I mean, you could go on forever. She is, she is a professor, she's a sociologist, she is a writer. She is someone that really, we are really, really honored to have here and she doesn't hold back. So all I want to say is that when you're asking uh, questions or making comments, be as open as possible because I know that she will be as open as possible. And I asked one question when we had a meeting with her this morning and I said, I wouldn't necessarily ask this in a public meeting. And she said, why not? So I think you can ask her absolutely anything. I want to uh, welcome her uh, to Dublin, back to Dublin, and to say how pleased we are and how honoured we are to be able to hear from you today. So, Emanuela, thank you very much. Thank you, please, yeah, if you like. Well, it is an honour for, for me to be here, of course, and also, Emotionally speaking, you know, I really feel at home, apart from old friends that I really consider very important also for my formation, I have to say, because I learned a lot from them. I think that Ireland is a, is a land that has um, a huge experience in uh, relating to you know, big powers and uh, trying to strive for its own uh, place in the world. And it's uh, now <laughs> on the verge after that been flourishing in a very important way in the European Union, it's fine, it's trying to find a way also to, to bring its own experience to the global debate in a more effective way. And I'm really honored to have been asked 
to share some opinions and maybe some very modest advice to contribute to this process of this country. So thank you very much for inviting me. I really feel at home. And I think that, as I said, uh, a country like Ireland in a, a continent like Africa and more specifically in a region like the Sahel, which is a very difficult region at the moment, uh, can really make the difference. And I couldn't say that to, to everybody and also to every country. So I think that this visit in the end, it's really very, very significant. Going to the Sahel uh, and Africa in general, some political points I want to make, uh, in particular referring to development cooperation. Mm, I think that we have done a lot in the continent of Africa as Europeans, Westerners, as we are considered, and also, of course, uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, every single country of the European uh, Union. But uh, a change is needed for a simple reason, because uh, despite our very strong ties to the leadership of Africa and of the Sahel in particular, we still speak different languages. We speak a language that is really uh, representing from our side our way of looking at the world. <clears throat> and of course, this doesn't always uh, match with the way the Africans look at us, and in particular, the Sahel looks at us. And I'm not, no, I'm not only talking about the leaderships, because of course, when you talk about the Sahel, you are in front of leaderships at the moment, most of them, who are the result of a coup d'etat. Uh, so these, these are putschist uh, juntas that govern uh, countries uh, uh, that are in desperate conditions because of uh, security, uh, immense security threats, because of, uh, unfortunately, huge uh, humanitarian crisis due to climate change consequences and other things, food security and all the rest. And also, of course, in terms of development cooperation, some incoherence and difficulty to keep everything together because of uh, the very serious uh, problems caused by the political changes and the global situation in general. So uh, when we talk about uh, Ireland, uh, I spoke to your Minister of Development Cooperation this morning. I suggested something very humbly, of course, but I suggested to make an action plan and uh, obviously to uh, concentrate on the things you do best in which you are uh, more capable. Uh, for instance, reconciliation uh, between communities and also, for instance, climate, because you have an experience in that and you have always focused on that. Education, education at large, starting also from the most simple things, not necessarily with the ambition of uh, creating a new system of education, because it's very difficult. Consider that in Mali and in Burkina Faso, terrorists have uh, um, demolished completely uh, something like 6,000 schools. And every time a new school is built, uh, something happens, it, it, the flood or, I don't know, a drought or whatever, and children are deprived of the opportunity to study. So we have to think about education in a, in a very uh, creative way, because, of course, the most important thing is to give people the instruments to understand, especially the reality in which they live. Now, regarding the European Union, because in this particular moment, I am the European Union representative, uh, special. Don't, don't deprive me the, the, the opportunity of being special, you know, <laughs> special representative for the Sahel. The European Union has done a lot so far, but since 2021, when I started my mandate, so many things have happened that have changed completely the attitude of the European Union. We had uh, two coup d'etat uh, in, uh, in Mali in 2020, actually, and 2021, but I was vice minister at that time, so I also know the, the previous uh, uh, president uh, that resulted from the first coup d'etat in Mali. Then we had two coup d'etat in, uh, in, uh, in, in, um, in uh, Burkina Faso, and uh, last year we had a coup d'etat in Niger. So you can imagine, out of the five countries of the Sahel, which, are, which is composed by Mauritania, Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, and uh, and Chad, uh, three have had a coup d'etat that have changed completely the, pol the political panorama. One is in a complicated situation, Chad, because uh, when the former president uh, died in, uh, in action during a battle, uh, 
uh, it was substituted by the by the son, which was uh, the fact of <laughs> you know, taking taking power without uh, a normal, uh, uh, let's say, democratic election. And therefore, Chad also is seen uh, with suspicion because we don't know whether you know, the things will go in a way or, or another, although Chad uh, at the moment had some elections that legitima legitimated the, uh, the president, son of the former president. So you can imagine how complicated it is. I don't, we don't want to go too, into many details regarding this. Let's go back to development cooperation, which is the most important thing. Who does development cooperation? Is there the money? Uh, what is civil society doing? In what relation are we with the... Uh, uh, the, the structures in uh, in place in uh, the countries uh, of the Sahel. Well, uh, at the moment, the European Union, I told you, in front of this very complicated situation, somehow panicked. So much that, of course, uh, we decided to suspend the budget support to the countries. We decided uh, to uh, be more prudent in terms of development cooperation funds and uh, projects. We decided to uh, stop the dialogue <laughs> with some countries in terms of uh, uh, talking to the leadership. And we would like to continue development cooperation uh, only uh, through the local communities, not through the governments. In all this, uh, what has emerged is that the European Union as a body of 27 member states in difficult, is in difficult conditions. Because, of course, uh, um, it has decided, in particular the high representative of the, of the European Union, has decided to uh, interrupt many of the relations. And this has, of course, uh, had as a consequence the fact that uh, at bilateral level, meaning all the single member states have decided to act on their own and to, for instance, uh, uh, continue to invest, uh, continue to have uh, high level relationships with, uh, uh, with the leadership. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, this has created a system by which we have on one hand, uh, Germany, which is a giant in the region with a huge amount of money, continuing its activities uh, independently, while France, as you know, has stopped all the activities and is really in, in a, in a situation of uh, stalemate, I would say, as well as, uh, I don't know, uh, countries like Italy that is continuing its uh, relationship with Niger to the point of keeping its own troops in Niger while everybody else wants to leave. So as you can see, there is a lot of, uh, let's say, independence in deciding what to do. What is the benefit for the countries? Do we get a benefit also? Because when we talk about the countries of the Sahel, we talk about partnership. Partnership is a very strange concept in the sense that in, uh, in the world of uh, diplomacy and international politics, when you talk about a partner, you make a revolution. Because uh, consider that until recently, we used to talk about the countries of Africa and the Sahel as, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, third countries, faraway countries, exotic countries, you know, something like that. And now we talk about partnership. Partnership implies to be equal, to uh, take decisions together, to look at things in a way by which uh, you try to design your future together, being aware of being, you know, protagonist, both of you in the future. Our partnership is difficult for the reasons I mentioned, for the coup d'etat, uh, presidents that are military colonels or uh, lieutenants or something, but they are in power, and it's very difficult to have an interlocution with them. So you can imagine that we are trying as European Union to keep our partnership going, but we at the moment are reflecting on how to do it because we have a lot of money in place. We still are the main partner of these countries, but some of the projects have been suspended. Some countries, for instance, Denmark have recently closed the embassies in Mali, unfortunately. I opened the embassy in Mali when I was vice minister of Italy, but Denmark at the moment is closing the embassies. And this is such a pain. I suffer physically for this because this means that one of us is leaving and is not present, is not going to speak to the communities, is not speaking to the ministers, not speaking to the functionaries, but this is the reality. Uh, to be very concrete, I can tell you that, of course, in my view, 
keeping development cooperation ongoing is fundamental also for political reasons. Because when you are there, you bring not only your money, but you bring also your knowledge, your expertise, your know-how in general. You bring your ability to interact with communities and you make a political statement because you recognize a need. And when you recognize the fact that there is a need in a place, that's a political statement. The same with humanitarian, uh, humanitarian aid. I firmly think that if you do humanitarian aid, it's a way also to send a message to the leadership saying, listen, we recognize that your people is suffering. We recognize that you are needing this kind of support. So that's another important element. So the European Union, in terms of humanitarian aid, remains the main provider at the moment has been surpassed by Germany and the US in Burkina. But anyway, we are still uh, amongst the first three. And at global level is the main provider of humanitarian aid. This is good news, I think, huh? because uh, obviously, at least <laughs> this principle, we are keeping very strongly. Regarding development cooperation, as I said, uh, on one hand, there are um, member states that decide on their own. And I think that Ireland is in that direction, going in that direction of uh, taking some decisions uh, that can really make a change, as I said. But also, uh, we are keeping the European Union as a reference point very strongly because uh, we have done very much in the past and we should not uh, erase everything that we have done and all the things that we have been uh, able to achieve. Just to give you an example, we managed uh, with great difficulty to keep uh, almost a billion of uh, euros of development projects in, um, in uh, uh, Mali while everything was collapsing, uh, the military, European militaries were going, uh, nobody's talking to the, to, the, to the leadership, we want to cut the dialogue, there were sanctions imposed on the country, but I myself also fought for this, we decided to keep development pro cooperation projects ongoing because that was absolutely necessary. You cannot just change also your image. You know, we are the body that provides development cooperation because Russia doesn't, China doesn't, others so and so. So, you know, we are development cooperation and humanitarian aid embodied in an institution. Uh, one last word about, uh, uh, just I've just given you hints of the complexity of the situation. And I just want to tell you one thing, also, especially the young people who are here, uh, complexity is the key. If you go for superficiality, it's killing the world. So we need to recognize the complexity of the situation. I hate when analyses are done from a distance, you know, trying to guess what the situation is and taking important decisions, for instance, at European Union level. We need to recognize the complexity. And this is why I want to make a point on civil society. Civil society in the Sahel, as elsewhere, is a key, key actor, absolutely key. Consider that in Burkina Faso in 2014, it was civil society that created the conditions for a first coup d'etat and a change of government. Civil society at the moment is still particularly active incredibly competent, very vocal when they are given an opportunity, but unfortunately in their own countries, the space for civil liberties is shrinking. So of course we are trying to work to preserve their opportunity to act. But they are also affected by other things. For instance, the fact that they are not uh, organized. They find it very difficult to interact with each other. They keep a distance from each other because they are always a bit suspicious. They are not uh, able to become a critical mass to bring messages to, to the governments. And this is a serious problem because, of course, we would like to help them to do so. But given the other problems, it's also very difficult to reach out to them. Most of the times so we are uh, too prudent, uh, also at uh, local uh, level with our delegations, because uh, maybe that uh, NGO, local NGO, maybe we don't know they are pro-government, they are against the government, they are against each other, we don't know. And therefore, who pays is uh, the strength and the ability to act and to pass messages of the civil society. So you can imagine, you know, when you deal with this kind of situations at regional level, 
it's a real difficult uh, situation. But the good news is that, and this is I, something that I tell our friends in the Sahel all the time, that 27 member states of the European Union, they all look at the Sahel as an important region. When in history has this happened before? Never. So I always tell them, listen, there is a huge opportunity. And this is why last year, and this is my legacy probably in my, in my work, the most important legacy, when there was a moment in which there was the risk that the European Union would really, the 27 would really lose interest in the Sahel, I would say there is nothing to do, so we have to stop caring for the Sahel. I insisted so much, and I actually obtained that in February this year, on the 19th of February, all the 27 member states declared that they wanted to remain engaged. The problem is how, and this is where you come in, <laughs> because it's from you that we get the suggestions, of course, and we need you to be more vocal, of course, because I think that from people who work on the ground and know the communities, know the language that we don't speak at institutional level, it's from them that comes the real uh, perspective for, for the future. So I, I think that a meeting like this is very important, but we need more Africans. So we need more opportunities for the Africans to come here and share, uh, more opportunities for the local communities to be vocal, and more opportunities for you, Irish, to share your expertise. And there is no country that can contribute more to at community level than Ireland, I think. So I really want to thank you for inviting me and I look forward for uh, your suggestions, comments, because I can learn a lot from you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Manuela. That was a, a very rich and, and, and stimulating uh, presentation and uh, it raises all interesting questions in my mind. Uh, we, we'd now like to um, open the, the floor for questions. Can I just ask, uh, straight off on my own behalf, listening to you talking about the complexity and the, the you know, the, 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 many different, the many differences between the individual countries, does it make sense still to talk about a single region called the Sahel? Now, it's defined by the EU in terms of five countries. The UN, I think, has a wider definition, but I, I'm just just curious, does it make sense to have a label like that when you're really, I mean, about the only thing that they seem to have in common re is the recent habit of military coups, which have affected three of the five. But I'm just wondering in a more serious way, do you find it useful to think of them as, as part of a, a single group? This, this uh, definition of five countries uh, corresponded to, to the Sahel is French. So they decided yeah. that uh, these were the five countries. It is true that there are other definitions. Don't laugh. <laughs> because we have well, a French amongst us. <laughs> he's very <laughs> welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome in our community. OK. I'm joking. And now, of course, he is my political advisor. Mm -hmm. But I was saying it's French. France that decided uh, virtually. Uh, I can tell you that I'm, I'm always afraid of these defini geographical definitions, although they're very useful because at least you know where they are, you know, the country. Because, for instance, President Isufu, um, former president of Niger, uh, who was uh, invested by the Secretary General Guterres mm. to, uh, to make a study on, uh, on the region and so on, is, is going to propose, and I told him not to do, please, uh, a new vision of uh, the Sahel with 18 countries. Uh, so, you know, now, uh, please, please. Mm -hmm. No, I think it's important to know that the Sahel geographically is there. Of course, we could expand it a bit more uh, to Sudan and, uh, you know, to, to, to the east. But certainly what is important is uh, uh, the fact that we refer to the five countries that until now were uh, the focus on our, of our policy. At the moment, three have formed their own yes, alliance. Yeah. But the Americans, for instance, I was in Washington last week, they insist on saying, who cares? They can do what they want, apart from anything in our uh, European Union. We have had a lot of changes of ge geography in the, in the history. So the most important thing is that we consider anyway the geographical area. 
And then all the changes, uh, of course, uh, we, we take into consideration, but they do, should not affect uh, the, the, the idea yeah. that we focus on that. Of course, there will be a, a lot of uh, um, effort to expand uh, to the coastal countries. At the moment, they seem more stable, but I am afraid of this. And therefore, everybody's thinking that uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, uh, Togo, and Benin are probably more reliable. But these things, I, I think, should not be taken into consideration because all the dynamics internal to West Africa are all interconnected. It's, it is as if you say that Italy and France should not be considered yeah. together. How can you not take into consideration all the interconnection and interdependence between them? Yeah. And Wendy, you made a very, I'll come to questions in one second, you made a very strong point about development cooperation as really the, the anchor of EU uh, involvement in the region. I think we would all have taken comfort from that. And I see Nora Owen, um, uh, former Minister for Justice, and Nora knows that the, the old development scene very well, obviously our Irish aid colleagues, but I think that that's a very, and the civil society uh, colleagues as well. But it does strike me that support for civil society, for, it's a pity in a way that there isn't a platform of some kind in those countries which would bring them together. I, I have to, I'm thinking of uh, the fact that in relation to the SDGs, every government is supposed to, every country is supposed to actually have a national consultative platform. Is that your experience in, in, in relation to those five? Oh, well. One, one of the major problem, problems in, in the region is the national dialogue, for instance, when it comes to the political you know, processes in, in, in each country, because uh, we, we, uh, we cannot imagine how rich mm. the differences in the society are, not, not to mention the, the, the fact that there are really hundreds of different languages that are not intelligible between them and the different traditions, affiliations, and things. So starting from this is very difficult. Mm. And as regards uh, civil society, I told you, the major problem is uh, uh, the political climate. Uh, they've been strong in the past. Uh, they are still uh, um, important. But because of this climate of suspicion and the idea that you know you never know what the consequences could be, there is a lot of uh, a lot of uh, difficulty in finding a proper platform. To be honest, uh, France has suffered in Burkina Faso. There was uh, um, the four people were ar arrested on suspicion. Yeah? Yes, are still arrested. Were arrested and mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because they were sus uh, you know the, under suspicion of having uh, trying to create uh, uh, some sort of su form of support to civil society. So you see, the climate is not good, uh, certainly. But we have to preserve the idea that we could support uh, uh, civil society. While instead, some people say, also in the European Union, why should we support a civil society when it's not a good civil society? Now, good or bad civil society is very difficult huh? to take yeah. the responsibility to say this is a good civil society, this is a bad civil society. Absolutely, uh, yeah. Nora. Yes, good, good afternoon. And, and it was fascinating. You're probably aware that when Ireland started to get involved in development right way back in Garrett Fitzgerald's time, the countries that we picked were all on the East Coast. Because I think my ignorance about the Sahel region is, is a bit big, I'm afraid, because we tended to think that it was French speaking and therefore we didn't really have a role there. It's still French speaking in a lot of instances. And, and I wanted to ask you, I mean, in some of the countries Ireland was working, you know, in Tanzania and Zambia and these, you know, there was a system where the EU delegate would bring together all the, the people from all the, the European countries that were helping with development aid. Does that happen in the Sahel, in, in this region? I mean, it would strike me that if you have lost contact with the government, you have to find some other mechanism to develop uh, a table for people to sit down at. So the EU delegate would, and I, I wonder how many EU people you have giving out that amount of money. You mentioned the figure of a billion. You must have a big staff. Yeah. Only money, but, uh, but, uh, but I wondered how well. many staff 
who are attached to the EU are actually in that region and could they be playing a part in bringing together not only the, Den the Denmarks, the Germanys, the Italys, but also then using that as a base to bring in the civil society. Because it strikes me that that has been a success in a lot of the countries Ireland is working in to get civil society involved and make them stay there. I mean, we don't hear many people from Mali or Senegal or Niger in the, in the list of people coming looking for asylum in Ireland. They tend to be from other countries. So I just wondered that whole area of making a structure available to allow the growth of both civil society, but also a government link. Well, actually, we, we have uh, this system still in the sense that, of course, uh, the European Union delegations that are diffused uh, in every single country, of course, uh, they make a lot of uh, initiatives in this sense. The real, but you know, usually these are projects that have an, uh, an effect uh, on the idea of reinforcing the relationship with the European Union. The real problem is that the, the civil society in itself, uh, the different members uh, in, uh, in the different um, capacities, the different organizations within the country itself. They don't, they don't, uh, they, they very rarely find a way of organizing themselves, uh, making platforms, because as I told you, uh, they are uh, in a way um, inactive in terms of uh, creating a critical mass because they don't really cooperate between each other, you know? And this is, a, mm. the, I think, the, the most important problem that we find in terms of civil society. Not to mention the fact that it's very difficult to express themselves because uh, this, uh, civil liberties are uh, restricted, uh, freedom of expression is uh, limited. Uh, I work very much also with the press and the press cannot do any kind of investigation. Uh, usually they only get uh, the news from the government, uh, which they then diffuse, but they cannot really have a proper dialogue. Exactly. Although, of course, they, they have uh, different journals in which they also criticize each other, but the real uh, um, facts and the, 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 the capability of uh, having, a, let's say, a, a say on what is happening uh, really in the country is impossible. And the same with civil society. For instance, there is a, a very important civil society organization in Burkina Faso, uh, which is called the Ballet Citoyen. And the Ballet Citoyen, they were able to uh, subvert the, the, the regime of uh, Caboret. And before this, this coup d'etat, they, <laughs> they sent away the, the previous uh, president. Uh, they are very reputed and they are more able to act also because they have had so much uh, uh, attention from the international uh, so much. I mean, Sahel is always uh, marginal eh, to other crises, but a lot of, uh, of attention from the international uh, um, uh, system that, of course, they are a bit safer in a sense because they are more visible and more protected in that in that sense. I remember the first one I, I went to to visit them. They are all youngsters. And uh, they said, they said, they sat, I sat down and they said to me, okay, now tell me why you feel guilty. Mm. I said, okay, yes, that's true. I feel guilty. And we started the conversation for many reasons. We have to <laughs> feel guilty being Westerners in Africa. But obviously uh, they are uh, honestly more protected by their own visibility while most of the others find it very difficult. Yeah. Thanks, Manuela. I have a question here from Brigadier Jera Hearn, who um, was the former Deputy Force Commander in Minurkat in Chad. Mm -hmm. You know that Ireland has had yeah. some peacekeeping yes. involvement, in, 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 particularly in Chad. Uh, he says that a great challenge for both uh, EU4 Chad and Minurkat was the absence of any credible co coordination between the EU and the UN in terms of the various instruments which were available. Um, uh, People pleaded for more coordination, but it, but it essentially, it didn't really happen. Do you feel that there is now a greater openness to coordination between the two in the Sahel? Well, we have a very different approach. That is the problem. Uh, the, the lack of coordination depends on the different approach. Uh, consider that while the European Union, uh, regarding the three countries, and in particular Niger, 
uh, where the two, the, the, there are uh, military juntas in power, mm -hmm. uh, has decided to keep uh, distance, uh, close down, uh, avoid dialogue. I am continuing the dialogue, by the way, not with Niger because <laughs> it was decided not to have any contact. But while the European Union ad ad adopted this kind of approach, the UN has adopted a completely different approach mm. because uh, um, in the last few months there have been visits to the three countries, the three uh, bad countries, the countries that create problems, but at the level of uh, um, the um, special, uh, special representative of uh, the UN for development cooperation uh, uh, called Mardieye, in the region, who went with a very high level technical mission to uh, Burkina, Mali and Niger, followed by Amina Mohamed, who, has, uh, who is the number two of the UN, because she is the deputy of uh, Guterres, and she is a, an extraordinary woman, no doubt, I've been in contact with her uh, all the time while she was doing these missions. And they have decided to enhance the cooperation, to uh, continue the dialogue accompanied by the World Bank. And the World Bank, for instance, has never closed doors to the, the, the Sahel. They continue to support. I saw uh, my, my dear friend, Diagana, uh, Usman Diagana, who is the number two of the World Bank and is uh, the, um, in charge of, uh, of the region in Washington last week. And uh, Usman told me very clearly, reinforced the, the idea that they want to continue to invest in the region and they want to help. The European Union is adopting exactly the opposite approach. So of mm -hmm. course, it's very difficult to coordinate also at uh, military level. Um, I think that uh, in MINUSMA there was a good cooperation, but MINUSMA is a very strange case. But in terms of cooperating with the UN, uh, that was the only opportunity that we really had uh, at the moment. The UN, the UN would like to propose to us uh, to act in our, on our behalf uh, as regards humanitarian aid and other things. Honestly, I think that we should rather coordinate, uh, but not uh, uh, stop ourselves being the, 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 yeah. the provider of uh, humanitarian aid. Otherwise, you know, we lose uh, really our personality, our beliefs, our principles, uh, and we do not protect our interests. I think that we have the European Union. We have to continue to be the European Union with the support of our like-minded uh, um, countries and also in cooperation with the other important actors like the, the World Bank, IMF, and... Uh, I think you'd find a lot of uh, sympathy for that position here, I have to say. Yeah. There's a, a question from Seamus Allen, who's a researcher here in the Institute, who, who, talks, who refers to the fact that there are debates really about whether it would be possible in some way to insulate EU development assistance for these countries from uh, human rights abuses, from the very things you're talking about. I mean, the fact is that the EU uh, tries to speak to it to to cater to his own interests and that includes um high standards of human rights and so on but is there some way in which uh, uh long-term eu assistance to those countries could be almost uh insulated from these other considerations um i mean i know about these debates i'm not persuaded by them, but I'm just wondering, it, it really follows on from what you're saying. You've got obviously, let's say, China and other parts of Africa, which is able to intervene uh, uh, intensively in different countries without any concern for human rights issues. Russia, we'll come to that in a moment, but it, it, it re it's a real dilemma for the EU that it would like to support these countries, but its own interests, or sorry, its own values, ultimately uh, limit what it can do. Well, the issue of human rights, I, I've, I've always said, and I repeat, is the real issue of this century, honestly. I am convinced I have two sons and I'm very worried for the future because of human rights, to be very honest. Because human rights are becoming uh, less and less uh, prioritary in our political discourses. It's a reality, I'm sorry to say. Also because uh, while we, of course, insist on human rights, universal human rights, the rest of the world in most parts are not particularly concerned. And uh, this is something that we have to take into consideration in the way we approach human rights in countries uh, such as uh, uh, the countries of the Sahel. Mm -hmm. But not only the Sahel, because also Nigeria, because also, I don't know, whatever. And uh, of course, uh, uh, this is something that uh, must um, 
influence our decisions. We have to keep uh, on uh, using human rights as a fundamental element of our actions, whatever, uh, from military to, um, to humanitarian aid to development cooperation. But we have to define new ways of promoting this kind of discourse. Because the, the way we have promoted so far, it seemed as if uh, uh, we were trying again to impose uh, uh, through a neo-colonialist or post-colonialist uh, attitude. Mm. So we need to find good ways of proposing it. I was again at the UN in New York last week and we were discussing it with uh, uh, with um, oh my god the name uh, here is uh, the lady responsible for human rights in the UN okay yes oh yeah and uh, and uh, we discussed it thoroughly because we need to find a new um, language for this for instance we have to make people understand that we, the fact that you promote human rights uh, reduces the uh, tension between communities and also reduces the anger of communities towards the government. Uh, it helps actually to facilitate uh, certain processes uh, within society. But this is a very difficult job. You can, can't just say this is universal, you have to respect it, because many things are very... For instance, we assigned uh, the uh, Samoa Agreement, mm -hmm. in, uh, the, which was a proposal of uh, the European Union for most of uh, Africa, and uh, uh, some of the countries uh, didn't want to sign it because they thought that there was an imposition to accept our concept of gender, uh, in particular defending the rights of LGBT plus, GBTQ plus, and uh, um, they stopped from uh, you know signing. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was at president level, ministers level, also countries that are considered by us very reliable and so on. They signed the ag agreement only when they were reassured that in in the matters such as gender, they uh, could follow the internal laws, not the laws of the European Union. Mm. So you see how complex it is. So human rights are fundamental for me, essential, but we have to find ways because usually China doesn't care simply because they don't apply um, lab labor conditions or anything. So they don't require mm. Russia at the moment doesn't care. But also other countries, Saudi Arabia, they don't care. And Saudi Arabia is an ally for us. And is also an important partner in the in the Sahel. This is why when they asked me what shall we do, I said, "Well, I think uh, you are good in making money. Yeah. Give money. <laughs> you know, don't don't pass messages. Yeah. Give money. This is what I said. But they know because I think money is always good. Anyway, so yeah. you know, because human rights are very controversial. Yeah. But if this uh, researcher can contribute to find solutions, I would be very <laughs> okay, well, happy to, to continue the conversation. Could I just ask a question, Emanuela, about the current Russian involvement, Wagner okay. and so on? Because I have the impression that maybe some, some of the Russians or some of the Wagner people are going back. To, they, they are being recalled, as a word, for duty in Ukraine. Uh, but what is, what is your current assessment? That the basis of all this story with Russia, there is a big misunderstanding because Russia is uh, present in these countries uh, since decades. Mm -hmm. In particular, Russia uh, supported the independence movements of, of most of the, the African countries. So they're friends since a huge, long, mm -hmm. eternal time. So they're not just newcomers. The things have changed very seriously with the war in Ukraine. So now we think the thing, we, we see things completely differently for good reasons, of course, uh, reasonable reasons. But the thing is that uh, um, at the moment they are present, but what they provide to the countries is really an illusion in the sense that they give very little. But what the, 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 the ministers, for instance, with whom I have a daily interlocution say, well, Manuela, if the European Union doesn't give us anything to fight against terrorism and we don't even have uh, uh, rifles to fight against them, even if they give us 0.5%, uh, it's still better than zero. That is the problem. So we are in competition on a very low level because, as I said, Russia really doesn't give enough. They are present in the territory of Mali in particular, 
And uh, uh, unfortunately, a big crisis started in 2021 when the new president of Mali, who was the result of the coup d'etat, decided to call Wagner as a Praetorian Guard. They wanted to protect the government, not really to fight against the terrorism. But for us, it was a red line. I remember I went to see, uh, to see the president, uh, Goita, uh, who was still in power, and I said to him, President, Consider that if you call Wagner, it will be a red line for the European Union. He didn't care. What followed was uh, uh, Wagner arriving, us suspending our training mission oh. of the military that was uh, training, uh, had trained already something like 18,000 soldiers of the Malian army, more than half of the Malian army. Okay. Then France, uh, of course, uh, decided to. Uh, withdraw Barkhane and everything precipitated from that moment. The tragedy is that the poor African countries, they lost us and they are not getting anything from Russia. Yeah. So the who's paying? Again, Africa. Yeah. Again, yeah, yeah. Africa. It's incredible. And this is why now the, 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 the Malians, for instance, insist that when they fight against the terrorism, it's their army that is fighting, it's not the Russians. Because in reality, the Russians are not fighting. They are there to keep the presence, to annoy us, to uh, make sure that they, dis they diffuse this information against us. But what the, the, the Africans get is very little. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Uh, no. Well, Wagner was a. a well, the story is very complicated in the sense that they, uh, Wagner was a, a group that was acting even without a contract. And uh, this was very convenient for Russia because uh, if they were doing well, they would, you know, take the, the advantage. But if they were doing badly, they would say, "Well, it's a non uh, non uh, a conventional uh, army." Now they want to to look more respectable and they want to to look more formal, right? Why are you laughing? Mm. Because you think <laughs> <laughs> Ken, um, Ken Ken Thompson. Thank you very much. Uh, we were dealing with year for years with all these sham democratic governments, which only represented the urban elite and hardly saw the rest of their country. Um, then when they were obviously uh, got rid of, uh, we, we kept on trying to establish a new pathway for the re-imposition re of democracy and setting deadlines for constitutional charters, for revisions of the, 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 the electoral rolls, et cetera, et cetera. Is there are there people within the military juntas in the C3 on whom one can build? For example, we all know that in West Africa, there is a tradition of, of um, military people like Thomas Sankara in, in Burkina Faso, who were anti-colonialist, but also very far-sighted and, and lived uh, ascetic lives. Do they not exist in these, in these three military uh, groups that are supposed um, controlling the C3? Well, Thomas Sankara, uh, every Christmas I read with my sons, <laughs> Quinte knows very well, the, the speech he gave uh, in uh, the African Union in 1987. I think it's unforgettable, unforgettable. You know, what he said and the, 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 the level of that man, you know, it really it's impossible to find today. That, that's the problem. But if mm. we talk about Thomas Sankara, it's as if we, we Italians still refer to Garibaldi as you know our, yeah. our hero. Of course, it's an important hero, but after Garibaldi, so many things have gone through. You know, we have, we have, we have other, other reference points. In Africa, at the moment, I find that it's very difficult to, you know, to identify figures that can really compare or be, let's say, at the level of Thomas Sankara or others of that generation. So uh, in particular in, in, uh, in the Sahel now, uh, fortunately, even the, 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 the people who surround the current leadership are critical because they feel that they are uh, not competent enough, uh, that they have uh, come, you know, uh, let's say, um, that they are in power because of uh, circumstances, but not because they really deserve to be leaders. And this is why the leadership at the moment defends itself from attacks from uh, other parts in, in the countries. So um, I think that that uh, era has ended. 
Sankara is still the reference point, but uh, uh, you know, one thing that we are not doing, which the Americans do all the time, is try to identify in civil society, within civil society, people who can really bring new blood to this story because you know they've done it during the, the, the Arab Springs, they've done it everywhere. They, they are probably doing something now because they did it with success Masra in the Chad, but then we are not doing it. We, we Europeans, we have a, a, a European endowment for democracy while the Americans have the uh, National Endowment for Democracy, but the National Endowment for Democracy is a factory of uh, future leaders. The European, you know, no, it's not. Mm. And the one thing I wanted to say, uh, when you were talking about the past leaders, we are still uh, uh, fascinated by those leaders who, who look like us. You know, the more they are, uh, the, they correspond to the image we have, uh, the more we think they are reliable, and uh, we need to support them. We will have to change because uh, in the end, uh, these people are going to stay in power. They are supported by the population. And uh, despite the, the bad things they are doing, the huge mistakes, for instance, with France, but also you know, with the, their own population itself, they will stay in power. So we have to change this image. We, we can't have the replication of uh, uh, Bazoom, because we like Bazoom, because Bazoom was talking to us in the way we like uh, them to speak to us. People can be different, and we have to get used to it. Manuel, we have time for two more short okay. questions, and then we will come to a conclusion. So the first first one is from Dastan Quaker, who says, well, who really asks uh, whether EU, the EU's migration policies are working in terms of the challenges represented by, by the Sahel. Well, one thing that emerges from this conversation and the other conversations we had today in Dublin and yesterday evening is that migration in the end is not the huge priority we think it is, in the sense that we didn't start with migration. You know, we, we are talking about migration at the end of this, uh, this uh, conversation. This means that migration is part of the problem. But as I always say, number one, uh, migration is much more consistent, uh, uh, and migration in terms of movements of people, much more consistent south to south mm. than south to north. Right. We know that. Uh, and when it's south to north, the great part stops, especially from uh, sub-Saharan Africa, stops in, uh, in the Maghreb. So, you know, uh, it's a completely different uh, image that we get. Uh, myself, I think that we should not use uh, migration in, the, in an ideological way mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, I'm not one of those who says that we have to defend the borders of Europe or, uh, you know, that, that, that there is an invasion. I'm very worried about the people who continue to die in the Mediterranean and in, uh, in um, the deserts also in, uh, in the Canaries, because they, 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 there are daily, daily, daily uh, yeah. deaths in the, in the sea. So this is the thing that worries me the most. I think that uh, some countries of the Sahel are, have understood that for us this is a very important thing at political level, and apart from anything, many countries use it as a, an important uh, also electoral campaign element. And therefore, um, the Mauritanians, for instance, uh, have started saying, well, if you pay uh, Tunisia to stop the migration, OK, pay us also to stop the migration movements through Mauritania, because Mauritania is a transit country. Mm. So they got uh, von der Leyen and Sanchez in Mauritania giving 200 million. And also, we activated the, 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 the European Peace Facility, which allows us to uh, support the military actions on the basis of the migration movements through Mauritania. So you see, it's it's an instrument. Yeah. The problem is that we have to go to the core of, of the problem. Now we need really to start thinking about structural responses. We need legal pathways, and this is absolutely essential. And at the same time, of course, uh, it is true that we need to give instruments to the countries to grow because people don't want to live. You know, we know that. Mm. Diasporas are fundamental, and we have to support diasporas more in our countries because they are supporting their own countries. The level of remittances is incredible. And you know how much uh, 
you know, um, uh, where does the, uh, the, the, the most part, 60% of remittances go? In agriculture. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you see, in yeah. the end, there is a, a rationality in what people do. Uh, you know, it's not just people living and uh, yeah. trying to, it, it's all very rational and we can contribute to this rationality. Yeah doing things. So I don't know. Last question, Manuela, uh, and it's a technical one, but it's it's interesting, uh, from Patricia Wall of Self Help Africa. Interesting to have your reaction to the idea of countries in the Sahel leaving the, uh, I think it's called the CFA zone, which means the currency is fixed to the euro. Mm. Uh, how would this be viewed by the EU and how might it impact the cost of living in the Sahel in the near future? This has been discussed for a long time. Um, it is true that uh, at the moment, it is becoming more urgent uh, because uh, there is this uh, anger towards uh, the West, we have to be honest, uh, and this is considered a colonialist uh, instrument to keep the countries under control. And uh, of course, uh, in the new mood of uh, new, it has been going on for quite a while, but it, the moment is, it, it has not intensified of uh, African ownership, not only by the countries of the Sahel, but in general in Africa, because this is the reality. Africa wants to be more independent from these ties, but wants to be more concentrated on partnership. I think that this will be discussed at one point. Yeah. Although, of course, uh, uh, don't think that the countries of the Sahel don't uh, realize what the problems are. They are very, 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 very clever. They are analyze everything very carefully, and this is why I think that the contribution of the IMF and of the World Bank is absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. I think that they are the ones who must take this responsibility to try to solve this very, very complicated issue. Yeah. Because uh, in any case, what we want in the end is African ownership. By all means, in the military terms, and there are, the, the, there are opportunities. The only thing is we need the political will and above all, uh, to change our mentality, because um, and this this is not only Africa that tells us, but the fact that India wants to become the leader of the global south, mm. and they made, for instance, a huge step forward by uh, letting the African Union enter the, the G20. And when we say African Union, you mean 54 countries. Sure. It's not one country. Sure. So they, they are acting. And also Egypt wants to become the, the leader of sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and we all have uh, difficulties with it. So unless we reinforce our profile and uh, we, we develop uh, a European African language or African European language, mm, we will find That's it a very good point in which to end, developing a, a, an EU African language yeah. and means of understanding each other. This is my slogan. So, I, I Manuel, on behalf of the IIEA, and I see the Director General, Alex White, there in the front row with us, um, uh, we'd like to thank you very, very much for a fantastic uh, um, uh, presentation, both informally earlier, but most of all now over the last hour or so. We really learnt a lot, quite an amount of things to do, and Michael Gaffey will have also benefited from the, the session you had this morning in the in the in the Department of Ministry. Uh, you mentioned the plan of action earlier on. Uh, I, I can see that filling up. I, I think you also mentioned the concept of political will. I think that's an impression that you are taking away with you from this trip to Dublin because there is undoubtedly the political will and I'm bowing to my present colleagues um, to to sort of take that forward, the, a will to engage more fully in, in the Sahel country. So thank you very, very much for well, it's paid. Thank you. And just let me say that I want to thank you for the challenging questions, because it's uh, not always the case. And also, I want to say to Ireland that we need Ireland more vocal, more vocal. Let yourself be heard, mm. you know, and speak up. Yeah. Thank you. I have no doubt.